The grand season preview series rolling on here at Late Kick. It is time to talk about the Florida Gators. I have said this once, if I've said it a thousand times, the team I am most excited about to watch in the entire Southeastern Conference in the 2020 college football season. We're going to do everything from biggest questions to areas of focus. We're going to do a full schedule analysis. I'm going to give you best, worst, and most likely record scenarios. And then I'll wrap it up with my prediction as to how the Florida Gators will fare this year record-wise. We start, though, with the mood tracker. The mood tracker to me is easy for Florida. You scan the message board, you listen to talk radio, you talk to your buddy at lunch, and it is ready yesterday. That's the mood. You've done what you were supposed to do. You were patient. You've bought into the process down there. You've got the head coach that you wanted in place. And so, you know, you've been to a couple of New Year's Six Bowls, and now it's time to take the next step. You haven't really been impatient you haven't really been crazy and you know lining up outside dan mullen's door with torches and pitchforks saying hey we need to win the east but now it's time to win the east there are no two ways about it time to win the east and i think they are in an excellent position to do that and i think you're right to expect that so let's dive in here the areas of focus this year for florida i'll tell you the one that i'm looking at and i want you to follow me here because it's going to probably send some folks into a tizzy when i say this you know how rarely i use the word tizzy the one thing I'm looking at is what I call the LSU factor. Now, let's notice what I didn't say. What I didn't say is, can Florida look like LSU? No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is this. There was a style. There was a way that LSU carried themselves last year. And initially, they weren't picked by many people, if anybody, to win the West and win the SEC and win the national title. But then once people realized, oh, they're serious, the mood collectively never changed. In fact, they got even more razor focused. And that's the kind of mentality that a championship team has. Uh, Florida obviously hasn't been there yet under Dan Mullen. And I'm wondering, it's one thing to enter the season with expectation and hopefully you're grounded and mentally your team's ready. But then once you get into the season, if you start validating week over week over week, uh, like against Ole Miss and then South Carolina, a and LSU, if you get all, let's say Florida goes 5-0. And they head into the bye week and they're coming into that game against Georgia. You know what people are going to be saying. I'll be included in the those people who will be talking up Florida like you haven't heard in the Dan Mullen era. What is the mentality? Are they affected by it? Because most teams would be. The few, the ones that are capable of winning a title, they maintain and even sharpen their focus when all that stuff happens. You've got to have that, for lack of a better term, LSU factor, LSU 2019 factor about your team. Another thing that I'm watching here is the fact that it may very well be that the entire SEC East hinges on the play of the Florida offensive line. Doesn't seem like that's the first time that we've said that. Now, what we need to happen here, if you're a Florida fan, what we really need to happen is we need the sum to be better than the parts. That's really what we need. There are not many all-American caliber players in this offensive line. There aren't many future first-round Sunday guys in this offensive line. But there are guys, if you get maximum potential out of them, that as a unit can be top half of the conference, top quarter of the conference. And if I were to tell you nothing more right now, then here's a guarantee I can give you. I can tell you that the Florida offensive line this year will be one of the five best offensive lines in the conference. You take that. I'd take it if I were you. I'd take that in a heartbeat. And if I knew that, if I knew that I largely had offensive line answered and I knew that it just wasn't going to be a massive liability, think about what happens. Everything else kind of starts falling into place from quarterback having protection to running game, having adequate blocking to all sorts of magical things that can happen offensively. So that's the second area of focus. The third area of focus is with Kyle Trask sort of being a returner now, a returning starter, it's always assumed that anybody who's returning as a starter at any position, quarterback included, just automatically takes a next step. How many times during this offseason have you heard, well, Kyle Trask is going to take the next step? What is the next step, first off? Second, is it statistically? I mean, is it you win two more games than you did last year? What does it mean? And secondly, once we define what it means, is Kyle Trask going to take that? Sometimes it happens. Sometimes a quarterback just is who he is, your rival. University of Georgia recently watched that happen with Jake Fromm. Guy came on in a pinch when Jacob Eason went down in 2017, and they ended up this close to a national championship. And Jake Fromm was just assumed to be a guy who was going to get 20% better every season, 20% better. Well, he really just was who he was. There was nothing wrong with that, but it's always assumed you're going to get better. And, hey, let's assume Kyle Trask is going to get better till proven otherwise. Hopefully he is. 
but that's one of my three areas of focus there. Let's get into the big questions for Florida. This one's my biggest concern. This is one, along with offensive line, I guess offensive and defensive line, that's where you start with any team. But I wonder if they have championship caliber depth in the interior of this defensive line. I know leading up to week one, depending on when you're watching this, you know, there have been some kind of cat and mouse games between Dan Mullen and the media down there in Gainesville. Stop me if you've heard that before about the status of Kyrie Campbell. Kyrie Campbell is the alpha of that unit. Kyrie Campbell is a must have and he wasn't on the depth chart. And then Dan Mullen says, oh, yeah, he's playing. Yeah, no big deal. So uh, independent of that, and I'm not I'm not dismissing that by any stretch, but that is what it is. We'll find out together in the season opener and in subsequent weeks what the deal is with Kyrie Campbell. And they really, really need him, make no mistake. But when you get past him, guys like Zach Carter and uh, Slayton Dunlap, like you know the names that are penciled in as starters or frequent contributors. But past them, when we're talking depth, not the last time I'm going to use that word in this preview, do they have it? Because you get into some freshmen really quick. Now, it's guys like Gervin Dexter, like really talented freshmen, but it's guys that you wonder, is he ready or are they ready in year one not to help us go six and four or seven and three, but to help us win the SEC East. Are they guys that can stand up late fourth quarter when Georgia's trying to march down the field and we got a 17 to 16 lead? I mean, can they stand up against a ground and pound kind of offensive attack? Because you're going to see it multiple weeks in this league, you're going to see it. So even coming into the season, if you're fully healthy, that's an area where you at least have a yellow light of caution around then if you have any kind of injuries or any kind of situation where, you know, someone starts to pile up uh, an amount of plays on you early in the first half and you're going 85 plays deep early fourth quarter defended, 85 plays defended, and you just have your starters out of gas, what kind of quality depth do you have to rotate in there? Because Todd Grantham likes to rotate them heavily. Does he have the guys to rotate? Second question, is this going to be an elite rushing attack? The names are there. It's not really much of a question. In fact, I think a lot of people have been encouraged by the whispers that you've heard, and they have to be whispers because everyone's got camp closed. But Malik Davis has apparently really come on strong here. It was thought, you know, if you bought a preview magazine, it seems like it was five years ago, but it was just a few months ago. If you bought a preview magazine, I'm guessing what you saw was you saw Damian Pierce, and he's going to be your starter. LaMichael P. Ryan's off to the NFL. So we got Damian Pierce, and then who is it behind him? Well, we got Lorenzo Lingard transferring in and then you got Malik Davis and hopefully Malik Davis can kind of find his spot as that number two back. Maybe not. And maybe you got co-starters there, whatever the case may be. I think it's a net positive. But besides that, we already talked about the offensive line. This ground game needs to be the focal point of this offense. Regardless of what kind of progress Kyle Trask has made, this is not a wide receiver core that has uh, Waddle and Judy and Ruggs. Like this is not a, a vintage Alabama wide receiver core where you just got stars everywhere where, you know, even if you just got an old tomato can at quarterback, they can throw for like 3,000 yards. That's not the case here. Uh, they got some talent there. Kyle Pitts is a phenomenal tight end, but it all revolves around having an elite ground game. And Florida's ground game was not elite last year. It was very disappointing to me, to be honest with you. So it needs to take the next step. Everyone else is talking about Kyle Trask taking the next step. You tell me the Florida run game is going to take the next step. I'll feel comfortable about everything else. Third question, just go back to the depth, but then let's kind of zoom out a little bit and let's talk about the roster. Florida fans, um, you, you, anytime I converse back and forth with you guys on the show and when I'm doing podcasts, uh, some of you kind of understand the route I'm about to go because I'm not focusing on any one position, but I'm just asking, is there championship caliber depth on this roster, period? When you look, let's, let's crack open our preview magazine one more time, our hypothetical preview magazine, of which I don't have in front of me, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, they're, they're obsolete now. Um, the names look okay. Like the starters, the starting 22, if you looked at with Florida right now, you say, rightfully, that, that team right there can win the East, and they can. When's the last time we saw a season where in December we cracked open said preview magazine and we looked at all the guys who were on the field the last week of the season and we look at what the preview magazine said the depth chart would look like and they're perfectly harmonious. Everything just panned out. No one got hurt. No one got injured. Nothing happened. Everything was just calm and tranquil all year. It never happens. So you know it's coming. You don't know where it's coming. 
whether it be offensive line, whether it be defensive line, whether it be uh, your number two corner, like whatever the case may be, the difference in Florida and Georgia's roster right now is not necessarily on the surface. You could argue one way or the other there, but it's once you kick over the topsoil a little bit and you look beneath the surface, that's where Florida is vulnerable to a team like Georgia. But you don't know where it's going to crop up. You cross your fingers, it won't crop up. But the championship caliber depth. See, there's a difference when you listen to the way people talk about Florida. There's a big difference between can they contend for the SEC East, which a lot of people are saying. A lot of people may even pick them to win the East versus that team's going to win the SEC championship. And there are far fewer people who put it in those terms because they're looking at a team like Alabama and then they're looking at a team like you and one of the hallmarks of an Alabama team is not only the frontline talent, but the quality depth. And that's kind of the next next step. There's that the next step phrasing. And that's the next step for Dan Mullen's program is developing that quality depth. You got to love a couple of the recent additions to this upcoming recruiting class from South Florida, the Homestead area, particularly. And I gave a needed tip of the cap there for Dan Mullen and his staff for that. But this is this year. So that's what we're focusing on this year. Let's go to record projections. So Colin will put up the graphic here and what I do instead of predicting just a win, win, loss, win, loss, and trying to decide what your record is going to be based on pure guesswork. I like to attribute a toughness rating to every one of your games. A lot of factors, a lot of situationals here, not just on the surface, in a vacuum. How hard is this team going to be to play? So as you see right here, Florida's got one game this entire year, and that's good. That's fortuitous. They have one game that is rated 10, and that's the cocktail party in Jacksonville. They have three games rated eight or nine. So four games total rated eight or higher on the one to 10 toughness scale. And then they got four rated six or seven and a couple of them back to back, by the way, in the latter portion of the season. That's again, very fortuitous that are rated five or less. I put them in our model. I simulate the season 1000 times and we get a best, worst, and most likely record scenario. Best case for Florida is 10 and 0. And I feel pretty confident in saying that anytime that you are a quality high level team like Florida and you're only playing one game rated 10 or higher, well, you can't go higher than 10, 10 and 0 is the ceiling for you. Florida is one of only three teams in the SEC that I have with the ceiling being 10 and 0. The others are Georgia and Alabama. The worst case, six and four, what's the most likely? Our computer spit out 8.5 and 1.5. What I did is I had to make an executive decision there, knowing how tough a 10 game conference schedule is and knowing that everyone will be beat to death to some degree by the end of the year. My tendency has been to round down most of the time here. So I'm going eight and two as my official prediction for the Florida Gators 2020 football season. Eight and two has you right in the mix for the East. Eight and two as a result has you right in the mix for the SEC title and the college football playoff. So take that and run with it all day long.